One of Japan's most important buildings was born out of one of the most tragic events in history. The Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in 2011 on Japan's east coast left about 20,000 people dead, wiped out entire cities, and caused a nuclear disaster. In the aftermath of the disaster, the government invested billions of dollars in building new tsunami defense systems. Now, about 400 kilometers of tall concrete walls line the coast. They are designed to weaken strong waves and give people time to evacuate during possible future disasters. But the question is, at what cost? Seawalls have been part of Japan's coastline for a long time. And over the centuries, the country has stood out as a world leader in coastal engineering. Just take it. The city of Taro suffered two devastating hurricanes in 1896 and 1933. Soon after, it became a global example of coastal defense systems, building an X-shaped structure with 2.4 kilometers of seawalls, each 10 meters high. In other parts of Japan, cities were incorporating similar coastal defense elements, including earthquake-resistant building codes and tsunami evacuation routes. But on March 11, 2011, it wasn't sufficient. Japan's coastal walls were designed to withstand waves up to 8 meters high, but the 2011 earthquake brought waves that reached 12 to 15 meters in height. The walls reduced the force of the tsunami, but the massive waves still rushed over them, in some cases completely crushing the structures and failing to protect the Fukushima nuclear plant. Really, before that, they were the most well-prepared nation in the world for a tsunami, but the simple tsunami was much bigger than they expected. And now, all that's left is to learn from the mistakes made and build even bigger walls, but ones that don't fail structurally. After 2011, the Japanese government set aside $12 billion to repair and build about 400 kilometers of seawalls along the northeast coast. These new structures are taller than the previous ones, reaching up to 14.7 meters in some areas, supported by foundations about 25 meters deep. They are built with wider bases and reinforced inner walls to better absorb the impact of the waves and help prevent them from collapsing. As part of Dr. McGovern's research, he built a huge tsunami simulator that can replicate waves like those that hit Japan in 2011. What was crucially observed in the experiment is that as the tsunami approaches, it develops in a way that doesn't reflect, like we see in movies and television shows, where you have a huge wall of water destroying everything. In the case of the 2011 tsunami in Japan, the water was more like a flood that gradually rose and built up hydrostatic force instead of a breaking wave. New recommendations in Japan's disaster scenario manual include the use of geotextile membranes in the walls to prevent leakage of the material used as fill, widen the rubble mounds of the breakwater and interconnect, and reinforce concrete blocks in the seawalls. But the height of the walls is their main use and perhaps their biggest disadvantage. One concern researchers have is that super tall seawalls can actually make the impact of tsunamis worse, creating a dam-like barrier which can release an even more intense torrent when it breaks. And for some residents, they are simply an eyesore. In some areas, they are almost four stories high, completely blocking the view of the sea and leaving some residents feeling like they're in a prison. Others fear that the walls will drive tourists away or that they are destroying the livelihoods and culture 
of their seaside community. Now let's understand the size of the challenge. Not all tsunamis are created equal. Level 1 tsunamis occur every 50 to 60 years. And it's against them that the new walls are designed to protect. But the large level 2 tsunamis, which can occur every hundreds or thousands of years, the walls alone are not enough. Public education, proper routes, evacuation, and alert systems are all part of a broader defense system. Some have suggested alternatives or supplements to the imposing concrete walls. One of the ideas is tsunami mitigation parks, which combine green elements like hills and trees with more traditional gray concrete engineering elements. The Marino Project proposes building concrete breakwaters on the coast supported by deep-rooted trees to help weaken the power of the tsunami waves and stop drifting objects. Another strategy used to minimize losses is the development of advanced civil engineering technologies. For example, buildings are equipped with uh, electronic dampers that can be controlled remotely. In simpler buildings, spring dampers are used which work in a way similar to vehicle suspension. These dampers absorb much of the impact caused by the tremors. This way, the likelihood of the building suffering cracks or structural damage decreases. Of course, another tactic is to move even farther away from the coast. Many municipalities have already moved their public facilities to higher ground, and some have banned construction on planes near the coast. Japan's seawalls are an impressive feat of engineering and offer a degree of resilience in the face of devastating destruction. But there has to be a balance between protecting ourselves from nature and living alongside it. And we need a lot more of these new infrastructure projects with each passing year. Precisely because of the rising sea levels and the problems they cause, more and more frequently. And the big question that remains is, how can we design and prepare without knowing exactly what the future holds for us? The 2011 disaster showed us that even the most tsunami-proof cities are not indestructible. Ten years later, this huge stretch of imposing concrete walls remains as a constant reminder of the past. And an attempt to design even safer cities for the future.